So I'm gonna flesh out the um, textural foliage on this side and then start it on the darkest darks. Um, may tack all these figures first, but we'll see how it goes. Painting trees like this um, try my best to think in just overall shapes of foliage rather than just individual leaves <coughs> to leave enough space here and there for um, some trunks and branches to peek through this is all going to vanish into the foreground so no need to get too picky about any of that. Again, while this is still wet, I'm just gonna drag in some of the larger areas of trunks, branches, sort of like calligraphy, and just not think about it too much, I hope. Not everything in watercolor, but m much of it stop myself from saying that because I want to make sure I mean what I'm saying. Many things in watercolor, I think safe to say, often look better the quicker you do them. But I don't want to say everything and I certainly don't want to say always. But very often that's true. It's sort of the um, fresh expedient brush marks that tend to look best So again, it's why I like to have an overall general plan for where I want my shapes, my darks and lights especially to fall. So, so while I'm painting, I don't have to stop too much and think about what it is I'm doing. Generally, the coverage of all that looks fine to me, but I think it's looking a little too specific. I'll tone it out with some darker shades, I know, but I'm just gonna soften it here and there with a um, mist bottle. Because I tend to do it fairly often, I know, I kind of know what's coming, which means I know I'm going to use some of this um, lavender, this Holbein lavender in the foreground to splatter into these darker tones. So I'm just going to get a little jump on it there. Love that technique, but it's one of those things that you can really overdo very easily and goes from looking really good to really bad in a matter of moments. So yeah, I'm happier with that. I like this tree that just sort of melts Again, I know I'm gonna be going over that with some darker tones that'll melt it even further. And I like that the clarity sort of comes in and out of focus a bit. It's just sort of the overall feeling I'm going for. Um, all of this foliage, statue, base, etc. I know that I'm gonna want it to all bleed together in one big shape with a little bit of clarity here and there and a little bit of lack of clarity as well. So it's sort of a little game I'm playing, a little trick. Hopefully it will work. Don't know if it will work, but you gotta just say to yourself, of course it'll work. Confidence helps somewhat, even if it's fake. Again, I like the overall coverage of that, but I don't particularly love the edges. I think they could be a little more elegant. So I'm gonna use um, some of this deeper tone. It's brown, the sepia. Drop into this here and there just to darken it because this is all gonna become part of this dark foreground shape before I'm finished. 
and try to feather out the edge so that the uh, termination of this whole shape looks a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah, happy with that. Again, these darker tones are gonna come over and meld a lot of that together. So to that end, I'm gonna get ready for that by softening up some of these transitional areas. That mist bottle can be a real ally, but also a real menace. If you use it too strong or too much, Obviously, it's pure water that's coming out. It can uh, destroy any edges or beautiful shapes you might have if you're not careful and can literally wash the pigment right off the page. So, choosing a mist bottle that has a sort of a very controlled, smaller area of spray, finer mist just helps, helps make your job a lot easier. I've had people that have come to my classes with these giant mist bottles I think they got from the laundry room or something and uh, they're good for wetting the paper but they're not very effective at um, being able to be controlled. Yeah I think I'll leave that. That looks okay. Okay, um, this will need to dry a bit, but I can start up here on my darkest shape. I will save these figures until later. They're not gonna be that hard to do. So this statue is bronze. The color is not unimportant, but it's not nearly as important as the value. It needs to be very dark to make the whole composition work. So far, we have lights, we have mid-tones, we have darker mid-tones, and these bits of sepia I dropped in are just beginning to hint at the deepest darks, but those are gonna largely be here. So again, it is a bronze sculpture, so bronze has a kind of, in reality, you can make it whatever color you wish, of course. But I always see it as having little bits of green highlights, maybe some blues, but it's largely sort of a deep, saturated brown with some green highlights. So this is sepia, not very much water at all, fairly opaque. Um, again, a little bit of color in this would not be a bad thing, but overall, it's the shape of it and the deep value of it that matters. That said, if I think, I think if I made it all just unrelentingly dark, it would look a little cartoony and as if it were cut out of a piece of construction paper. So within the overall dark shape, I'll sort of leaven that big dark shape here and there with some, some lighter tonalities and dropping in some cobalt teal. It's a long way around the barn to say that. I think this teal with the dark brown will be a nice combination. Obviously, I'm turning the board this way and that just so that I can reach these areas more easily. Not to confuse you. If I did, I'm sorry. As this big orb, this is, um, the statue is Atlas. So of course it's a nod to Greek mythology. Atlas, um, oh, do I have my mythology correct? I think it was a mortal man 
but doomed or condemned by the gods to holding up the weight of the entire world or the heavens upon his shoulders for likely some transgression that he had. Um, you can correct me in the comments if you know the origin story of Atlas, but it was a heavy lift. I do know that the, uh, the idea of Atlas was adopted a bit by the uh, objectivists under Ayn Rand. And uh, the figure of Atlas was very prominent in her novel, uh, Atlas Shrugged. So I will not go on an Ayn Rand rant, believe me, I will not. I tried to read The Fountainhead a number of times. I finally did, but not before throwing the book across the room quite a few times. It was very frustrating. Um, I'm going to use some of these smaller flat brushes at the top of the uh, this open orb that he's holding. The reason is because I don't want solid edges to read right off the page. I want to feather them out just like that. So to keep the energy of the painting down here rather than up off the top of the page. The center of focus of almost every painting um, is going to be where the um, area of highest contrast is. So wherever your darkest dark meets your lightest light, that isn't necessarily the center of focus of your painting, but very often it is going to be. It is where the, the eye of your viewer is more likely going to go more immediately than anywhere else. And you, the artiste, have it in your ability to quite easily um, control that, to manipulate where you want the center of focus of your painting to be just by where you decide to put your um, area of highest contrast. It's just that simple. So you don't have to find it, you make it. It's yours. You are in charge. Even uh, even Ayn Rand would get that comment, I think, uh, the seal of approval. So some of these smaller rings that are receding into the distance, I'm not making them as solid or as saturated as the foreground rings, so I'm allowing these to, with this small flat brush, feather out more quickly, sort of uh, melt and disintegrate a little bit. And I'm going to work on this before it dries, I hope, so i got to hurry up here. And then keep all of my deepest darks more in this area. So I'll create this sort of um, dark, light, dark value sandwich, if you will. So I talk a lot about uh, connecting connecting um, areas of value in your painting. It, yeah, it's critical. That said, it does not mean your all of your darks, for example, have to fall in one spot. They can be in a pattern as long as it's designed and intentionally done so. Certainly, they don't have to all fall in one controlled spot. But can be spaced out over the painting as long as the design works, you'll be fine. All right, this dark area down here is beginning to get a little dark, so I'm gonna, I mean a little dry, so I'm just gonna add a little moisture to feather it out. And I wanna finish his uh, <clears throat> other arm, and then I'll come back and flesh out the rest of this.
flesh out. It's such a massive, imposing statue in reality. Um, like many cities, New York is filled with amazing sculptures. It's just, it's amazing how many of these incredible things we just tend to walk by and barely notice. This one, though, always just stops me. So even from this amount, you can see now my value plan is starting to <clears throat> more clearly emerge and fall into place, I hope. The darkest darks in the foreground, the lightest lights sort of in the middle distance, or the midground, the midtones in the background. So I think it's not wrong to have some of these sort of uh, organic natural skip marks here and there. A little bit of sparkle of the white paper showing through I think is good, but I don't want too many. I'm now sort of transitioning away from the sepia and uh, teal tones into just right out of the tube neutral tint which is not black, but it's pretty dark. It's really sort of a, a neutral violet. It's just a really quick way to get darker if you need to quite quickly. So I'm just assessing as I go. Some of these little white sparkles are actually quite nice. Others I think are a little messy and distracting. So I'll keep a few, knock a few back. But the reason for that is I'm just trying to intensify the darkness right at this area. So I'll get this nice sweep of dark, light, dark. Uh, this will be dark at the bottom, but not, not as intense, I expect, as what's happening up here. It's a bit of an experiment. I'm gonna just drop in a little bit of this Uh, lavender into that deep wash to see if that helps or just looks weird and distracting. The Holbein lavender is a semi-opaque color so it's physically kind of heavy so it sinks down through a darker wash and then sort of floats back up to the surface and makes these uh, if you're lucky, beautiful, intentional blossom shapes. So poor Atlas has this odd belt made out of chains wrapped around his waist. Oh, the Greek gods were so harsh. didn't mess around. So I'm thinking a uh, little glints of lighter bits on the podium and maybe on his leg here wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, don't think I'll go teal, but I might drop in a little uh, raw sienna, a little bit of this warm tone at least just a little. Not sure if it's a good idea, but I don't think it'll hurt.
just reminding myself that color, whatever I use, is fine, but it's the value that matters far more in this case. So the whole thing really has to hang together as a dark shape, regardless of whatever color I feel like using. Poor guy doesn't have a very substantial step to uh, climb on here either. But that's all they gave him. So now I'm just gonna allow the bottom bits here and there of the sculpture to melt into the uh, podium. So it all reads as one. Then I'll swap back to flats and try to connect the rest of this. Um, not a huge deal, but I want to think a little here about the way um, the built environment, the podium melts with the, uh, with the landscaping, the natural world a little. So I want this to look fairly organic and evocative. So it isn't too obvious, but it's uh, definitely, definitely a thing. So if our light is coming from here to here, this side of everything is gonna naturally tend to look a little darker, so this foliage on this side, I'm going to deepen up a little, just using sepia at this stage. Nothing fancy. Then I'll go back to the flat brushes and um, try to connect all of this. Clearly you can see a figure here in the shadows. He will be fleshed out a little, but I don't want to give him too much, uh, too much focus because he's going to be in the shadows. He's really there for just textural interest. This is raw umber. I'm scraping it over the rough surface of the paper here to give it a little bit of value, but I want to maintain some sparkles of light here on the brighter side and not so much on the darker. <clears throat> Just allowing the foliage and the architecture to melt together fairly organically. Yeah, the look isn't bad. I think the value isn't quite right. This wants to be darker overall. So before anything really dries, I'm going to drop in some, this is neutral tint. Just allow it to run around. That kind of look is what I'm going for, because even though this is in the foreground, I don't, again, want it to be any more specifically architectural than the, uh, the cathedral in the background. The shape of it, I want to, the profile, I want to be clear, but um, no specifics are particularly necessary. with some planting, which I could ignore, but I do want it. I think it's gonna help just step everything down and connect everything a little bit more uh, organically.
Right, um, okay, all this area wants to be dark, but it doesn't want to be as dark as this. Never a great idea to have pure white or very dark leading off the edges of your page. So I want the shape to hang together as dark, but within that shape, there can be some other tones and less saturated values. Always looking for ways to make my areas of shadow look more alive and allowing some of that light to show through is the way to get there. Some of that is by using transparent colors naturally. Others can be by uh, brush application. Some of this dry brush work helps uh, enhance the sense of transparency. So it isn't solidly painted. It's, um, again, overall a shape that works nicely, but there's some luminosity and some character within it. Um, subtle colors, warms and cools, little bits of blue and violet here. The figure I can tell I will paint later in sort of darker blues and let him just melt into the shadows. Here I'm misting it just to get those tones to uh, run together and join up more seamlessly. All the brush marks for the most part are in the vertical plane to try to keep, emphasize the vertical story of the whole painting. Painting up from the bottom is a really useful technique, but it comes with a downside that you can splatter paint over parts of the painting you may not want to splatter, so just be vigilant. If you catch them before they dry, you can take care of them, no problem. Yeah, so, so far, uh, not finished, but I'm relatively happy with that. The, this shape looks good. The luminosity is there, but the value is also there. This little bit of clarity and the bits of obscurity I want are all there, so that makes me happy. These trio of figures needs to be put in. Uh, these are not portraits of real people, obviously. They're just people I sketched for scale, context, and um, to help flesh out my value and color story. So they will happen, but I think I'm gonna come in here and put some more uh, general dry brush tones on some of these buildings in the background, both to give a little more texture to them, but really to, to flesh out this darker value story. Uh, this is just raw umber, but I think it has a little bit of sepia. Yeah, it does mixed in. So anyway, just for texture, but also for um, sense of value. You can paint up from the bottom or down from the top. This kind of thing just helps join shapes, add clarity or obscurity, which is what I'm trying to do really. I'm trying to just fuzz out certain areas and leave them a little bit more ambiguous. I like that.
some of these areas I painted a little while ago, and um, I'll be honest, I thought, I thought I got the values a little bit better than I did, but now I can see they want to be a little bit, have a little more character, a little bit more heft. But no worries, it's easy. And I don't mind that it obscures some of this tree, that's all fine. It's really just a carrier for my value plan anyway. It's good, although a little bit more of that brightness could tell another sub-story through, and it got a little diluted when I misted it. So I think while it's wet now, I will, um, I think rather than brushing it in, I'm going to splatter in a little bit of orange. So the best way for me is to take a synthetic, this is a Nascota Perla, a round brush, not a lot of water, more pigment than water. And I'm just going to splatter that on. Some of it's going on dry-ish paper and some going on slightly wet. So you get what I think is a nice um, toggle between harder and soft edges. While I'm at it, just because I know I'll do it eventually, I'll splatter a little bit more of this lavender in. This is something I love to do, but I can, I'm so guilty of overdoing this. So I just want to uh, take it easy. Yeah, it can look good, but it can look really gimmicky and spotty if you overdo it. I'm just going to uh, edit here a little, take off a few. That's plenty. Yeah, I look back at a lot of my older paintings, not that old, and assess them, and I'm... <sighs> have no problem finding fault, but I think if I could boil it down to one thing I do wrong more often than not, is I just love to paint too much and I don't stop quick enough. A lot of my older paintings, maybe 10 years old or so, even at the time I thought they were really pretty good. I look back now and even the better ones, I have to say, well, oh, might have been all right if you'd stopped an hour before you did. I think I was a little more insecure about just putting a brush mark down and leaving it. And so, um, <clears throat> a lot of my older paintings are just like a, gosh, a laboratory of techniques, brush marks, you know, masking and resists and scraping and opaques and pretty much every technique and gimmick in the book. None of those things are wrong. None are wrong. It's just when you use too many of them all together, yeah, it's just so easy to overcook a painting. So yeah, most of my older paintings were just left in the oven way too long. And by older, that can be paintings I did last week too, because I, I can still do it. I'm just a little bit more vigilant about trying to be aware not to do that. So these figures, again, their value is far more important than any color I might drop in. And I don't know how much of any color I am gonna use on them, but I think a little here and there. They're important and I'm sure they're very fine people, but they are not the stars of this particular show. And so I don't want them to dominate. They're all part of this values story. So 
So I'm just using uh, tones of sepia, little bits of uh, neutral tint when I want to get very dark very quick, and some warms, little bits of orange, burnt sienna, that sort of thing. The people are a little bit specific. I think they need to be in this case. Often, I'm not a big fan of drawing very specific people, but structurally, they do sort of relate to this guy, and I want them to then probably fall into that family of um, anatomical clarity. Obviously, they're a little more forward than any people you might see across the street, so a little bit of detail would, would make a certain amount of sense. That's true, but yeah, anyway, it's like everything else in this painting. It's uh, walking a fine line between uh, clarity and obscurity. Little bits of detail that are just enough. Any of those of you who do paint, which I'm sure is most of you, this comment will come as no surprise, but it's usually the things in your painting that aren't necessarily that important to the whole work, where everything can go south. You know, badly painted tree, contorted looking car or a really strange looking human figure can just ruin an otherwise good painting. It only takes a second. So nothing I can say will make that any less true except if I have any advice and it's for me as much as it is for you, simplicity The shapes of these people is, are fairly accurate in terms of anatomy and that sort of thing. But I'm really not, specifically not, rendering in um, um, bits of clothes or stripes or outfits or anything. I'm remembering, I'm reminding myself that what makes these people work is their value and their overall shape everything in a watercolor or any painting really the success is reliant on just shapes shapes of value all that said i'm very tempted to drop in a little bit of a jewel tone on this woman so i think i will I may regret it. Oh, I could undo it if it looks really awful. But into this deep wash of uh, neutral, in a very general, not specific way, I'm gonna drop in a little bit of cad red. I think just off center, the way she's standing, the painting can use a couple of little jewel tones and I think she'll, she should be one. But even at that, I didn't paint in uh, her clothing exactly, specifically. I just dropped in some general color and allowed it to run around in the wet wash. So that it implies she's wearing something of color rather than rendering anything specific. Yeah, I think it was the thing to do. So where I am with this painting is okay. I don't uh, regret anything that I've done so far, except I would say this area, I think 
even though I was giving you a warning about splattering as being a technique that can uh, look muddy and overdone really quickly, I did it anyway, and I think that's exactly what happened. This area to me looks, um, looks unresolved. It's not tragic, I think I can um, monitor it, but I, I'm not thrilled about it. It looks a little, uh, uh, both undone and overdone at the same time. But not to worry, I have a plan. And that is when it's a little bit drier, I think I can just brush up some unifying shapes from the bottom and connect some of those uh, inelegant shapes at the middle and it should be fine. Um, shadows, reflections. They're on this uh, outdoor plaza here. I don't know if it's terrazzo or what the surface is, probably just concrete. There would be potentially, even on a dry day, some light sense of reflections. Always, I think, when you draw people, they, they need to look connected to whatever surface they're standing on. This gimmick of painting reflections, I do it a lot. It can look good, it can look quite good, but it can also look very forced and artificial. So I think, again, simplicity, just a little is the way to go. And using my other free brush, my finger, just to feather out the edges. Um, I opted to do that rather than do strong sun shadows because I'm just trying to, again, emphasize the vertical story in this whole painting. And I wanted to do that then so that the paint, the sort of specific painting I did on the bottoms of their legs and feet could blend in a little and again, everything would connect. I've lightly drawn in a bunch of people uh, at various distances walking down Fifth Avenue across the street. They're really just there for texture and scale. Not all that important to the composition, but I will. Just paint them in, I think, in lighter tones of the um, umber, sienna, that sort of thing. Very, very uh, schematic, simple. In so-called real life, when things tend to get further away from our point of view, they often tend to get a little blue in the distance. So by rights, these figures should be a little bit blue, but I think just in keeping with my color story, making them just pale sienna um, for me works. You are absolutely free to disagree with me if you wish. I don't mind, it happens all the time. The real key is not too dark, definitely not too detailed. I just think by making them in this family of colors, they belong a little bit more to the cathedral than to anything else. There's one figure on this side of the street who can have a little bit more depth of value, but I don't think needs a lot. So just putting a little sepia tone on this figure. And then a little bit of just pale blue, just to mix things up.
Okay, um, all fine. Just need to address this figure, unify some of these shapes, a little bit of tonality along the bottom. I think we'll be good to go. So this figure, uh, I want him there, I wouldn't have added him, but um, <clears throat> again, it's just literally the, the theme of this painting, sort of making things there, but not making them too focal or making too big of a deal. So he wants to be emerging from the shadows. But I don't want the whole figure to be this dark. So the top part, yes. And then he will melt down into the shadows. I'm using a neutral tint and some violet. and this medium-sized flat brush just to uh, feather him down into the foreground and become more abstract about his shape. Painting like this, the drawing of this took about two hours, and I believe the painting of it should take about the same amount. I think I've been at it for about, probably a little over an hour and a half. I haven't checked. But typically a painting like this would take me between, oh, two, maybe three hours at this size. Bigger, yeah, it'll take longer. No, not necessarily, but probably. So there's some of these forward planters that I'll make, again, not a big deal out of, but this sort of in and out of focus idea. Yeah, it's all rather still wet over there. I need to wait a little while. So yeah, I want to wait till all this sets up and then I'll little tone to the bottom. At this stage, I wanted to go back and reassess the cathedral and anything else in the painting that I thought needed um, any additional attention. Not much, if I'm honest. I think, um, I could see putting a little bit of detail on um, some of the cathedral windows, that sort of thing, but again, less would be more. I think it could stand it, but I wouldn't want to overdo it. Keeping it in the same family uh, of coloration as these figures, for example, this is just raw umber. So a gentle um, earthy warm brown. I like doing this. It's easy but I'm just so aware that um, it could be too much and it could happen before you know it. So just little bits here and there, I think. I think uh, just like painting windows on a building, if you do one or two and then skip a couple and just make it a little bit intentionally irregular, it has a, a nice way of looking better and more finished than if you painted absolutely every little thing. So this beautiful big rosette window, I'm just gonna paint uh, little bits of these shapes and then skip other ones all together. Yeah, that kind of thing. It gets the story across without spending a lot of time. A 
what I'm basing this on is the, the clarity and strength of the statue, I think has, tells me that this portion of the background could handle a little additional detail without pulling forward too much. But really not that much, so easy does it. And I'm being sort of intentionally sloppy with the way I'm applying paint here. Um, again, I want the drawing to read through to sort of tell the more rational technical story. And I want the painting to be, generally speaking, looser and more fluid to tell the more emotional side of the painting. It's those two um, disciplines that I'm always trying to, to balance off in my work the sort of rational mathematical and the more poetic narrative. Mess those up a little bit. Um, I agree it's a sort of an unusual way of painting this sort of very specific drawing with this kind of non-specific way of painting on top. And it really is not the right way, and it's not the only way I paint. I don't think it's right for every subject. I don't know if it's right for any subject, but I like to try to do it. I think, uh, again, when you end up with this interesting dialogue in your final work between... Uh, the sort of prosaic and the emotional, the narrative of the drawing and the poetry of the painting, it can be very compelling. Um, do I always get this right? Gosh, no. Do I ever get it right? I like to think so. But I have way more many misses than hits. I'm very, um, interested in painting theory and ideas, and uh, I'm more interested in ideas about painting and definitely more interested in ideas about building. So yeah, it's fine. It's what excites me. It's what interests me. It's what I think I'm good at. But no, it doesn't always work. And I think it's working here. Again, as I say, you're, you're perfectly welcome to disagree with me and think this is a crazy way to paint or a way that doesn't work for you. And if you think that, that's good. That means you have your own developed aesthetic. You're not looking to me or anybody else to tell you what's right or wrong or how you should paint or what you should paint. Nobody can tell you that. That's entirely up to you. I'm just here to share with you the kind of experiments I like to make and um, really encourage you to uh, not do what I do. Unless you want to, it's fine. But really just to talk more about the whole idea of experimentation and ideas, ways of painting that may or may not work for you. Just try them. Don't fall in love with anybody else's technique other than your own and uh, it's fine to admire others but nothing compares to working out your own ideas yeah i think that's about enough um a few of these marks i think started to look a little too specific so i'll just soften them so all that i was doing gave i think the foreground enough time to dry, so I'm going to add a little tone, as I said. I'm going to use a larger Escoda, three-quarter inch. This is mineral violet. 
gonna mix a little bit of the uh, ultra blue in so it's sort of a blue violet I'm using very little pressure to try to get as much of this um, what I consider attractive dry brush marks happening as I can. The point of this is to try to connect the, the shapes, the shapes of value, to sort of anchor the bottom of the drawing a bit to add a little bit of additional value without having to run a wash, but also some additional texture. And it adds a little bit more of this, I think, compelling ambiguity to this particular painting. It's a very, very simple design of values and shapes with very complicated vocabulary of imagery. So it's another kind of uh, contrast I was trying to work with. This figure I painted when uh, it wasn't quite dry underneath, so I'm going to add a little bit more of this blue-violet to this figure, just at the top, and let it feather out. So again, he kind of emerges from the shadows. I don't want him to look spooky, but I just want him to look uh, just part of the composition. That kind of overall look is what I'm going for. It's, it's a shape, but it has a lot of variety and um, some luminosity to it as well. So it isn't all just relentlessly dark and spooky looking. Okay, I tried it once, it didn't work that well, so I'm gonna try it again, which is probably a mistake, but here I go. I'm going to use um, a little bit more of that lavender to splatter over this area. Now that it's a bit drier, I think um, it won't melt away quite as much as it did before. I think here and there I want it to melt a little, so I'm going to encourage with a mist bottle some of it to melt. I'm going to allow some of it to stay just where it landed. Um, I'm asked very often, do you erase your pencil lines when you're all done? Uh, that's not a yes or no answer for me. Sometimes I do, if I want to really brighten up an area. For example, here, I might go in with a, an eraser when this is 100% dry in a few hours. Just to brighten it up and also to add a little bit more ambiguity, yes, I might erase that. Up here, no. I love this mixture of watercolor with the pencil line showing through. It's part of the whole idea of this painting, so I would definitely not erase anything up there. Also, once it gets wet, the, the pencil marks don't want to come off very easily anyway. But again, here I might just to brighten it up even further and add just that other note of mystery. But otherwise, everybody, um, that is about it. Um, again, it has to dry for a couple of hours, but uh, I appreciate your watching and I hope this was uh, helpful entertaining at least. And uh, I'll see you all again very soon. Happy painting!